Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and tonight's guest is Dr. John Quackenbush. He is Professor of Computational Biology and Bioinformatics in the Department of Biostatistics at Harvard School of Public Health, and he's the director of the Center for Cancer Computational uh, Biology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and he has about eight other titles. Please just see our website for those because he has a very long list there. Dr. Quackenbush has a very interesting background. Uh, shortly after he received his PhD in theoretical physics, he was lured into what was then the development of the uh, Human Genome Project, and he joined the faculty of Craig Venter's Institute for Genomic Research. So he was in one of the, the, the two key uh, projects, parts of the project. He joined that institute in 1997 where he and his group developed analytical methods that he would later refine and expand when he subsequently joined the faculty of Harvard's uh, School of Public Health and the Dana-Farber uh, Cancer Institute in 2005. Dr. Quackenbush, as you may know, is a leader in the field of genomics and computational biology. His current research focuses on the human cancer using systems biology, uh, approaches to understanding and modeling the biological networks that underlie disease. He and his team have made fundamental discoveries about the role a variation in gene expression that uh, is in defining biological phenotypes. Dr. Quackenbush is here tonight to discuss the exciting developments in the field of genomic medicine, something that is really emerging very quickly, a whole new uh, emerging paradigm for medical care in the, in the future. His work represents the frontier of this type of research, and it's a very special honor to have him come and talk with us tonight. And we welcome with enormous pleasure, pleasure Dr. Uh, John Quackenbush. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Um, what I want to do is take you through a little journey of how we've been thinking about this whole problem or uh, the opportunity of doing personalized medicine. And it's a very interesting story. It's one that's really driven in large part by new technologies that have just opened the floodgates of data and information. But where did this come from? Where do the technologies come from? What really drives this whole process? And if you start thinking about those questions, what you realize is the answer um, is really rooted firmly in uh, the Human Genome Project. So, you know, why is genomics so important? What has it really provided us that has allowed us to think differently about a whole host of problems in biology? And the answer is that it really takes us back to the roots of our understanding of heredity. Uh, so, this gentleman in the picture is actually one of the pioneers in genetics. Uh, this is Gregor Mendel, an Austrian monk, and, and the thing that Mendel did, everybody probably remembers Mendel from high school biology, breeding peas and, you know, looking at wrinkly peas versus smooth peas and looking at different uh, flowers and the color of the flowers. The thing that Mendel did was by studying traits and how traits pass from one generation to the next, really realized that those traits were passed with a defined mathematical relationship, at least the most basic traits. And what's so important about that is it really fundamentally defines the rules of heredity. It points out or it underscores the fact that we uh, obtain traits both from our mother and from our father. And that when we pass those traits on, those traits are passed on randomly, whether it's the trait we uh, uh, receive from our mother or the trait we receive from our father. And because of that, we could start to look at the relationships between traits and the material that was used to convey those traits. 
Um, something we later discovered was a molecule called DNA. But the, the important thing about these traits is that when you look at an individual, because of the way in which um, this DNA message or the, the genetic message is passed from one generation to the next, that a, uh, the traits in an offspring are really a combination of the traits one sees in that offspring's parents. So uh, Mendel in many ways really laid the foundation for genetics, a foundation that was discovered and rediscovered a number of times. But um, his contributions are really fundamental even for what we do today. Uh, the second stop in my story is, is Charles Darwin. Everybody knows Darwin from evolution and origin of the species. And the important thing that Darwin really recognized was that if we look at organisms, they're not static, at least not the traits that we see, that those traits evolve over time in a species. And that in fact genetic changes can arise spontaneously. That if we take a group of organisms that look identical and, and isolate them geographically and subject them to environmental changes, that there may be traits that arise or evolve that give certain individuals an advantage. And as those traits evolve and arise um, and that advantage manifests itself, that that genetic background can actually come to dominate uh, a population or dominate um, a region and uh, cause a species to look and behave differently. Now, you might think about that in the context of, you know, Darwinian evolution and maybe Darwin's examples of finches on the Galapagos Islands. But even today when we think about diseases like cancer, cancer is a genetic disease. It's one driven by evolution. It's driven by spontaneous genetic change where things like chemotherapy select the fittest tumor cells to survive and adapt. And uh, recognizing this was really important because what Darwin realized and something we see today is that as these changes arise they can pass from one generation to the next. And while we tend to think about fitness, we talk about the survival of the fitness, it's really survival of the fit enough. What gives us an advantage to reproduce? And what gives the tumor cell an advantage to reproduce? And so we start to think about these genetic changes and how they influence the development and progression of disease in the same way we think about how they in influence the development and progression of traits in a species. Um, the third stop along the way is, is these gentlemen, um, Francis uh, Crick and James Watson. And uh, just about 60 years ago, 59 years ago, uh, Watson and Crick published this beautiful one-page paper in the journal Nature that outlined uh, the structure of a molecule called DNA. And the thing that was really amazing about this structure and this molecule was that the structure allowed us to begin to understand the observations of Mendel and Darwin and others about genetics and how genetic changes evolve, arise, uh, and are passed from one generation to the next. That over on uh, in the middle of the screen, sort of on the left-hand side of this paper, this, this little structure, this double helix, this spiral staircase, in fact, contain the ingredients um, that uh, we now know are responsible for transmitting genetic traits from one generation to the next. So the model in that double helical uh, diagram that Watson and Crick drew in their paper is a very simple one. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. It's a long chain polymer made of uh, nucleic acid sub, uh, subunits. And the thing that's amazing about the structure is that the two strands in the DNA molecule that you can see on the top are really positives and negatives of each other. They're complementary. One matches the other. In the sense that if you look at the four bases in DNA, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, A, C, G, and T, that those four bases, in fact, pair together in a very specific way. Adenine A always pairs with thymine T, guanine G always pairs with cytosine C. So if I take this molecule and tear it apart, what I can do is I can build two copies from those single-stranded DNA um, strings that exactly recapitulate the sequence of the original molecule. So what this allows us to do is actually understand how genetic traits can be passed from one generation to the next as cells divide. Because if A always pairs with T and C always pairs with G, if a cell divides and I take the DNA and pull it apart and allow it to recombine or uh, to be resynthesized, what I can do is make those two strands again perfectly 
But it also allows us to understand how genetic changes can arise spontaneously because when Darwin really postulated these changes could arise spontaneously, uh, that model is actually captured in what we see in DNA because when I say A always pairs with C and G, uh, A always pairs with T and C always pairs with G, um, what I recognize is that whenever I say always, it's not always, that in fact there can be mistakes. And those mistakes are what we call mutations. They're changes in the underlying structure of the DNA. And so in fact, uh, inside cells there are elaborate mechanisms to recognize these changes. And they almost always work, but not quite. And so over the course of our lifetimes we uh, accumulate mutations, we accumulate changes in our DNA, and those changes are actually fundamental changes that we can pass from one generation of cells to the next. Um, and they're changes that can be passed from one generation of individual to the next. So is this really true? Does this model work? Well, here's a picture of DNA replication. And in fact, what you can see is a single, this is an electron microscope picture. You can see a single double-stranded molecule bifurcating and the two new strands being synthesized with this double-stranded structure to be passed to the next generation of cells. So DNA and its structure uh, has been extraordinarily successful. It explained how genetic information could be passed reliably from one generation to the next. It explains how variation, or what we call polymorphisms, can arise. Uh, and how those polymorphisms could give rise to the genetic and phenotypic variation that we see. The phenotype is the, the outward expression of that genetic message. So differences in height and eye color and skin color and all the traits you think about are phenotypic differences. Uh, and how those could actually arise spontaneously uh, through changes in the underlying DNA. One of the things we eventually came to understand is that DNA is not the end of the story, it's just the beginning, that in fact DNA mediates what happens in the cell through an intermediary called RNA. Um, and it provides a framework by which we could understand that process of genes, elements of DNA that encode traits being first transcribed to RNA, then translated to proteins, and the proteins making up the machinery of the cell. It also allowed us to begin to understand the, the molecular basis for disease, because we could begin to look for changes that occur and changes that correlate with cellular dysfunction, with the development and progression of diseases, with changes in disease traits. So how does this all work? Well, I got my start, as you heard from Yvonne, um, uh, now I guess almost 20 years ago. Um, but I got my start from physics and I had to really go back and think about what this DNA message really entails in terms of molecular biology. So I'll give you my understanding of molecular biology in seven very simple words. Um, inside the cell, there's DNA. And inside the DNA, there are elements of DNA we call genes. The genes encode proteins. Uh, so what we understand now is the DNA is transcribed to RNA and translated to proteins. Those proteins actually fold into a three-dimensional structure. And that three-dimensional structure help dictates, helps to dictate the function of the gene or the gene product. So the analogy I always like to use is if I take a piece of metal, I can use it to make a hammer or I can use it to make a wrench. If you're like me, you've probably used a wrench to pound in a nail, but it's very, very difficult to use a hammer to loosen a bolt. So the structure is actually important. And in fact, we see diseases where the structure of a folded protein is a fundamental element in the development and progression of disease. Mad cow disease, prion disease, is a pro caused by proteins that fold the wrong way, cause other proteins to fall, fold the wrong way, gum up the machinery in cells, cause cellular death, and cause disease. The really interesting thing about um, molecular biology, though, though, is that we know that these genes don't operate in isolation. And in fact, many genes encode proteins, the job of which is to regulate the expression of other genes. Other genes are turned on and off inside cells. And that regulatory process actually creates feedback loops that helps distinguish one cell type from another because the expression of certain genes in the context of certain signals um, causes other genes to be turned on, on and off. So what we've really wanted to be able to do is to look for the causes of genetic disease. And one place we've always looked is in genes. So people started to look for mutations or variations that could cause disease. And in fact, finding disease genes is extraordinarily difficult. Inside every one of your cells, there's DNA. That DNA is packaged in chromosomes. All of us have 23 pairs of chromosomes. 
There are 22 pairs that under, under a microscope look more or less identical. We call those autosomes. So 44 chromosomes are 22 pairs. In males, there's an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. In females, there are two X chromosomes. And so uh, we have 46, and our gender is determined by, our, one of our phenotypic traits is determined by uh, one of the easiest to detect uh, changes in DNA, the presence or absence of a Y chromosome. Uh, but if you look at how much uh, material is actually stored in those uh, chromosomes, in one copy, so in 23 of the chromosomes, there are the 22 autosomes plus the X and the Y. The Y is really tiny, uh, so I'll throw it in there. There are about 3 billion bases of DNA. Okay? So how many are there exactly? Every one of us is a little bit different, but it's about 3 billion. Uh, 3 billion is a number which is difficult for me to understand. It's slightly larger than my salary. Um, it's, slightly, it's much, much smaller than the national debt. Uh, but to put it in perspective, 3 billion is about the number of seconds in 95 years. So if you were to start thinking about how much information was encoded in your DNA, and remember you have two copies of uh, this set of autosomes and sex chromosomes, um, there are about 6 billion bases. So if you were to count every base and read everyone off one a second starting at birth, you'd have to live to be about 190 years old to get through the entire collection. So it's a tremendous amount of information. And uh, what we recognized was that it was important to start collecting that data and that information in a systematic way. So in the early 1990s, uh, scientists first at the Department of Energy, then at the National Institutes of Health, started thinking about going beyond looking one gene at a time and really started to think about the possibility of collecting the entire genetic sequence of a reference human being. And so a project was started in the early 1990s to sequence or read off the string of A, C's, G's, and T's in a representative human genome. And it was really about 12 years ago in June of 2000 um, that um, these gentlemen, Francis Collins, who at the time was the director of the National Institute for Human Genome Research, and Craig Venter, who um, at the time had left Tiger and uh, got involved with a company, Solera Genomics, uh, these two gentlemen uh, in fact, led projects that raced to sequence the human genome. The, the public project got a big head start. Um, the Venter and others sort of stole technology from the public project and went off and, and did it themselves. Uh, there's a lot of scientific and social and political controversy. But at the end of the day, in 2000, uh, a truce was brokered. Uh, and there was a press conference that was held uh, in Washington with Bill Clinton sort of, I guess, mediating um, the uh, discussion between these gentlemen, standing between them to, create, to prevent a fist fight from breaking out, uh, but uh, to announce the completion of the first reference human genome map. And really recognizing it was an international project, uh, there was a simultaneous uh, press conference held in the UK in London where Tony Blair stood with scientists from the Sanger Institute, which had been heavily involved in sequencing the human genome and represented the biggest effort in Europe. Uh, there was a large group of people around the world, scientists in Germany, in Japan, um, in Italy, in Spain, who contributed to developing the maps, the tools, the techniques, the technologies that came in this announcement. And what this announcement really represented was a high resolution map, uh, a first pass catalog of all of the human genes. And while the, the draft genome was announced, finished in 2000, it would take another five to six years to really complete and finish at some level that genome sequence. Nevertheless, this gave us some really important tools because within that genome, we were able to discover about 25,000 genes. And people argue about what genes are and how many there are. So there are 25,000 genes that encode proteins. They actually encode many more than 25,000 proteins because of the different variants of these genes. But what these protein lists do, or the gene lists do, is they give us a parts list for a human cell. We can understand what proteins are encoded where in the genome. We were beginning to understand where all those proteins fit into different components in the cell and what they do. And how different genes, when they accumulate mutations, can actually cause cellular, the cellular machinery to break down. So 
we've got this parts list and what we're trying to do today is to put all these pieces together into a wiring diagram. It's sort of like imagining getting a parts list for your car and imagining that you know how that car works. But what's even more amazing is that if we look at that parts list, that parts list that we think of as being representative for a cell is in fact the parts list for all the different types of cells that exist in our bodies. So we're trying to understand not only what the parts are, but how they fit together and how they're put together differently in different cell types. And the reason we want to understand this is because hopefully for most of us, what our brain cells are doing is very, very different than what our liver cells are doing. What our muscle cells are doing are very, very different than the cells in our lungs or our kidneys. So how do we take this material, how do we take this information and put it together? Well, what we're really starting to do is to understand that we have to look at this problem differently. We can't take a reductionist view and begin to believe that everything is encoded in the genes. That in fact the genes are part of a larger ecosystem in the cell. And so that what we have to do is take a more holistic approach to understanding human disease. That we have to think about these genes not operating in isolation, but in fact in the context of other factors, their environment, other elements in the cell, proteins in the cell, interactions between the genes, things that activate genes, have them transcribed to RNA or not. Other types of RNA in the cells that aren't just copies of the genes, but in fact something more interesting in many ways, things we call microRNAs, non-coding RNAs, that bind to other RNAs and influence whether or not a gene is translated to a protein. And we also have to understand environmental effects. Because genetics isn't deterministic. I have certain genes that have helped influence how tall I am, but my height today is influenced by nutrition and a variety of other factors. If I had really poor nutrition, I'd probably be shorter than I was. If I had better nutrition, I might be taller than I am. Um, and almost everything that we think about as being a phenotypic trait is influenced by environment and chance. That sometimes genes are turned on, sometimes genes are turned off, sometimes diseases develop, sometimes they don't, and there are environmental factors that influence that, there are genetic factors that influence that, and sometimes blind luck influences it. So we're really starting to get a much better picture of the processes that link the DNA, which 20 or 30 years ago we would have thought played an almost central and um, definitive role in defining phenotype, we're starting to understand more and more that the situation is much more complex. So when the genome was sequenced, even 10 years ago or 12 years ago, uh, people would say, we're saying that genomics and having that genome sequence is going to transform medicine. And I can tell you that today, 12 years later, uh, our perspective is that having that reference genome really hasn't transformed medicine in and of itself. But it's new technologies that have been spawned by the Genome Project um, that really have started to change the way we think about biological systems. And then in fact there are a whole host of omics sciences, genomics, epigenomics, cytogenomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and on and on and on, um, that have really been defined by a dramatic increase in our ability to amass data. And so that the challenge today with some new technologies is not, in fact, generating data. It's actually bringing the data together with other sources of information so we can understand the funda fundamental basis of human disease. So how successful has this been? Well, I want to just give you an example of how we've been able to leverage new technologies and genomic technologies to start to think about the molecular basis for disease and to start to understand this whole problem of personalized medicine. So the problem in cancer, where there's been much more work than in any other disease, is that we never really realized the full complexity of human disease. I mean, we know if two people have breast cancer or colon cancer and we treat them with the same drugs, one may survive and the other may not. And we didn't really understand why. But we always thought of disease as sort of being monolithic. You have breast cancer and it's breast cancer and that's what it is. But we understand that at some level, in a very visceral level, that there are differences between different tumors. What genomic technologies allowed us to begin to do is to understand the molecular basis for those differences. So that while we could use clinical information like the size of a tumor, its grade, how um, uh, undifferentiated the tumor was,
uh, how extensive it was in terms of its local metastasis. Well, that gave us some clues as to how well someone might respond to therapy or how likely they are to survive. Uh, that in fact it wasn't the whole picture and, and could miss many things. So some early stage tumors may be very aggressive and some late stage tumors may actually respond to therapy well. And so it really suggests that there's some molecular basis for this difference, that there are different genes that are turned on and off in these different tumors in the same way that there are different genes turned on in your brain and on in your liver. So the question was, can we use these genome-inspired technologies to classify human cancers in a clinically useful way? And one of the first technologies where we really saw a big impact was on DNA, uh, was uh, in the use of DNA arrays. In particular, what we call DNA microarrays. And while there are many incarnations, probably the most widely used was uh, a technology developed by a company called Affymetrics. It was a set of synthetic pieces of DNA complementary to genes in the genome that were synthesized using a photolithographic technique on the surface of a chip about the size of a postage stamp. And what we were able to do using that DNA chip is put down representatives of the 25,000 genes in the genome plus other things which were candidate genes. And then what one would could do using this technology is actually take a biological sample from that biological sample, blood or tumor or other tissue, one could extract these nucleic acids, either DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, or RNA, ribonucleic acid, the intermediary between genes and proteins. We could extract the DNA or the RNA, and we could query it using these chips. And in fact, the most widely used chips were those that queried RNA, because what that allowed us to do is to see what RNAs were being made, which allowed us to see what genes were being turned on. And so we could look at that RNA, we could label it with fluorescent dyes, allow it to bind, and then really by looking at the fluorescence intensities, determine which genes were turned on and which genes were turned off. So Pat Brown and, um, excuse me, Todd Gollum and Eric Landers and others here in Boston actually used one of the first, uh, conducted one of the first really extensive uh, analyses of gene expression in tumors and asked whether or not you could look at the differences in how genes were turned on and off to understand the differences between different subtypes in leukemia. And what Lander and Golub and their colleagues did was they looked at two subtypes of leukemia, ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and ALL, acute myeloid leukemia. And when they profiled these on an array, a DNA array, what they were able to do was find that there were different patterns. So here, red represents genes that are turned up and blue represents genes that were turned down. And if they compared ALL and AML, which they did for about 38 patients, uh, they were able to see a very clear distinction between these diseases in the genes that were turned on and turned off. And you can even look at this by eye and really see that difference very clearly. So that if you had the expression levels of these genes, if you looked at how the RNAs were turned on or turned up, turned down, turned off, you could actually distinguish AML from ALL. You could predict for a new patient who walked in the, in the door without having a pathologist look at their sample, discriminate between those two disease subtypes. And one of the interesting things about this paper is that they actually found a sample that had been misclassified by a pathologist that when they looked at the molecular profile, they saw in fact it wasn't what it was called, and when another pathologist went back and looked at it, they realized there was either a clerical error or some kind of error in judgment, and that the sample had been misclassified. So the molecular tools demonstrated the ability to discriminate between these disease subtypes. In breast cancer, though, we've probably seen the single biggest application of this technology. And this was an early paper by Charles Perot, uh, David Botstein, Pat Brown, and others, in which they took DNA arrays and actually profiled expression patterns in uh, a variety of different breast tumors collected in, um, at Stanford on the West Coast and in Sweden. And what they did, and I apologize that this is red and green, this is the picture from uh, the paper that they published. Um, I think designed to torment colorblind people who may not be able to see red and green. But uh, the red and green here represents different patterns of expression where red represents up and green represents down. And what uh, 
uh, Perot and his colleagues were able to do was actually look and see the same sorts of patterns with many more genes. Here there are about 1,100 genes they analyzed. Uh, but if you took the data and just grouped it together based on these profiles, what they saw in this hierarchical clustering dendogram, this mathematical tool that allows you to group samples together based on shared patterns of similarity, that there were distinct branches, distinct subtypes. And the important thing about these subtypes that they saw in the data was not that they existed, but in fact that there were differences in the clinical outcomes for these patients based on the genes that were being expressed. So you could group people together and actually make a prediction about how likely they were to survive the disease. And in fact, what we now recognize is that there are at least three, if not four, there's some debate over how uh, well we should try or how precisely we should try to separate groups, but at least three or four distinct molecular subtypes of breast cancer. And the thing that's amazing about this is that those subtypes now are treated as distinctly different diseases. The therapies that are used depend on the genes that are turned on and turned off. So we've come a long way in understanding the relationship between DNA and RNA. And even at the level of simply looking at genes turning on and off, we've been able to begin to think about this process of personalizing treatment of treating disease differently based on the molecular profiles. And what we've started to realize more and more is that the simple diagram that I showed you is actually much more complex. That in fact, the genes and proteins and RNAs come together to form complex networks of interacting molecules and cells. And that these networks actually derive, drive a lot of the functional differences that we see between different cellular types. That these networks of interacting objects make the 25,000 genes simply part of a much larger, much more complex picture. If you look at the number of parts that make up your car, it's not millions, but they're put together in different ways that allow all the different complex systems in your car to function, and many of those same parts are parts that are used in boats and airplanes and, and other machines. So it's not just the parts, it's how the parts are hooked together. And in fact, we're starting to realize that it's more complex than those seven words. In fact, it's more complex than these eight words. That beyond the genes, what regulates the genes are actually other factors, these epigenomic factors that we talked about before. That in fact, inside cells, we used to think about this very simple process of genes encoding proteins. Some of those proteins being what we call transcription factors, the little TF in the diagram up here that this is a protein encoded by another gene that would bind upstream of a gene in the DNA and turn it on and bind to a specific sequence in the DNA to turn its downstream target on or off. That that simple picture in my first seven words is actually supplanted by a much more complex picture that represents the way in which the chromosomes themselves are arranged that the DNA isn't just a string of nucleic acids. It's wrapped around these little proteins called histones, um, almost like beads on a string. And that those histones can be chemically modified by other proteins, enzymes in the cell. And that the DNA can actually be chemically modified by um, enzymes called methylases to add methyl groups, CH3 groups, a very simple chemical group that changes the ability of RNA polymerase to copy RNA from that string of DNA. So that the regulatory processes in cells are very, very complex and that the structure of the entire DNA wrapped around these histones, bound, to bound together in chromosomes, chemically modified, in fact regulates the process of gene expression. Our understanding of that process is only beginning, but the place where we've made the greatest progress is in understanding nucleic acids, understanding DNA, understanding RNA, and understanding how the patterns of variation contribute to the development and progression of disease. So what's driving this? Well, it's really technology that's driving our new understanding of everything from genetics to epigenetics, genomics to epigenomics. And what we recognize is that we'd like to be able to use these technologies to really understand the entire life cycle of disease and to really be better positioned to be able to do things like estimate genetic risk. My grandmother died of Alzheimer's disease. There's a gene called APOE 
Mutations in APOE increase your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. If I had my DNA profiled, I might be able to tell whether or not I had an increased risk. But I might not want to know because as of today there's no effective treatment for Alzheimer's. On the other hand, if uh, I carried a mutation in BRCA1, a gene that's been associated with breast cancer, while I would have a slightly elevated risk as a man of developing breast cancer, my daughters might have a much significantly elevated risk. But would it be a death sentence for them? Maybe not. What would they choose to do? What would their physicians choose to do? That kind of information can be really critical and we're trying to gain information that will allow us to do that. We're trying to understand how genetic changes occur in disease so we can better detect disease early because many diseases are caused by spontaneous mutations, not variants that you inherit from your parents. Once we detect disease, we'd like to be able to stratify patients based on molecular profiles the same way that we stratified patients in breast cancer by understanding what genes were turned on and off. That we'd like to use that information to begin to dictate therapy in exactly the way we do in breast cancer. In the way we're beginning to do in other diseases like melanoma, skin cancer, there are genes now that are the drugs now that target mutations in specific genes, in particular a gene called BRAF. That a mutation in BRAF can be targeted by a drug that can cause almost complete remission of the disease. Amazing therapies that come from understanding who is going to respond, that come from understanding what the basis of the drug's action is by targeting drugs to specific mutations or specific variants. The whole goal of this is to try to improve outcome, to increase survival, and ultimately to give patients a better quality of life, to let them understand what their chances are for survival and to allow them to make decisions about how much treatment is enough, how much treatment is too much. A lot of this, as you probably guessed, has been driven by these DNA chips, but in fact, what we're really coming to recognize more and more is that these chips are being replaced by new technologies, new approaches, driven by new DNA sequencing technologies. So how do you turn this vision of personalized medicine into reality? The first thing you have to do is assure access to samples and make sure patients are consented to use those samples to drive studies. You have to develop a platform, a technology platform for generating data. You have to think about integrating information. And we're coming more and more to recognize that if we have genetic data or genomic data, that our ability to interpret that data with six billion bases in the two copies of the genome is minuscule if we don't know something about a person's health and history and family history to point us in the right direction to look at potential causes for disease, to look at potential um, uh, mutations that are driving their disease. Uh, one of the things that this really dr uh, drives us to do is to recognize that in building a program in personalized medicine, since we're at the early days, that it's really a research-driven enterprise. Uh, we have to realize, too, that although people like me live and breathe this data, that we're not the only people who are poised to interpret it, that they're physicians who want this information packaged and delivered to them in ways that they can communicate it to their patients and in ways that they too can understand. Um, we also have to think about how we enable research beyond what people like me can do in collecting all of this data. We have to bring in corporate partners because in academia we're not the only people uh, who are looking to try to use this data and we're not the only people developing technologies to generate it and interpret it and that the problem is so big that none of us can really do this on our own. And then last but not least, we have to communicate what we're doing back to people in the general public, that we ourselves are not the be-all and end-all of doing research. That in fact, if we're getting samples from patients, that those patients have to feel like they're part of the process, have to feel like they're respected, and have to understand why uh, contributing data and information to this process is so fundamentally important. So how do you assure access to samples? Well, it turns out that if you really look at patients, patients are very interested in being a part of the process of curing disease. In fact, almost anybody who's studied this problem of informed consent, something that's the cornerstone of biomedical research, if you talk to patients, if you go to a cancer patient and say, would you be willing to uh, donate your sample to better understand the disease? The answer is almost always yes, because the patients realize that they don't want their children 
or their grandchildren or their cousins or nieces or nephews or strangers to have to suffer from the same disease and that the genetic material in those samples in fact represents an incredibly valuable and irreplaceable tool for beginning to understand the nature of disease and patients understand that readily but the informed consent has to make them feel like they're part of that process of discovery you can't go to somebody and say I'm going to take your DNA and I'm going to do whatever I want with it and I'm going to profit from it um, there's a wonderful book The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks that talks about a woman who had leukemia and her cells were taken and used to generate a cell line that's driven billions of dollars of research and her uh, relatives who are alive today many of them are poor and have no health insurance and this is fundamentally wrong in some way that these patients aren't brought into the process and made a better part of the process uh, and made to understand what their role is in the process and really given a stake in the game one of the challenges though is that there's legislation in the US called HIPAA the Health Insurance uh, Portability and Protection Act that requires uh, that we give patients informed consent and maintain patient confidentiality and it's a problem not in that we have to do these things but in fact that it allows many people to fall back on the lowest common denominator um, in terms of providing access to research material and that's to make consent very very limited and to guard data because that data by guarding that data they're guarding uh, patient confidentiality if you talk to patients though that flies right in the face of why they contributed samples in the first place they want those samples they want the data available to cure disease the challenge is that with genomic information identifiability in genetic studies has become a moving target and that plays into people's fears and people's use of this act HIPAA so our understanding and our ability to cope with this is really evolving rapidly but as the cost of sequencing falls and we approach a, in a time which we can generate a thousand dollar genome sequence in the age of Facebook where younger generations have a very different view of privacy than we do today what all of this means is completely unclear okay? so the new genomics this new genomic technology has really become a disruptive technology because it's forced us to really revisit these questions about what we mean by identifiability and security and protection in order to be able to generate this data though and build a program in personalized medicine you need to develop a technology platform and this is something that's absolutely astonishing to me this is actually a graph of the cost of sequencing a genome it's from the National Human Genome Research Institute the NHGRI and what this graph represents is the falling cost of genome sequencing when I first got the data from their website I plotted it and I did a little regression analysis and if you look at the curve I drew it has absolutely nothing to do with the data because what you really realize is there are two curves the first curve is the old technology that was used to sequence the first human genome and the second curve in gold is a curve that represents new technologies that came on board in 2007 and the thing that's astonishing about genome sequencing is since 2007 the cost of sequencing genomes has fallen by 33 percent per quarter every four months it drops by a third and that trend has been consistent there was a little blip and after that blip the cost plummeted and so I looked at this about two years ago and I said well we're going to hit a thousand dollar genome in October of 2012 we're going to hit the hundred dollar genome in February of 2014 our ability to generate this data is just unprecedented and the cost of generating data has fallen and while there's a lot of interest in the US in regulating access to data if I can swab a q-tip of my cheek and send it to Beijing and have it sequenced at the Beijing Genome Institute the genie's out of the bottle and this data is going to be available and we have to come to grips with what we're going to do with it now when I said the thousand dollar genome was coming later this year everybody laughed at me in fact um, people are really fixated on technologies like this and I have this sequencer in our lab at Dana-Farber it's the Illumina uh, HiSeq 2000 and it will give you about 30 fold coverage of a genome so deep enough to really be able to understand variations that exist um, it costs less than ten thousand dollars it can deliver a whole genome in about a week and in fact um, the cost has fallen even in the last two years two years ago we sequenced an ovarian cancer genome and it cost us about sixty thousand dollars today there are companies like Illumina and Complete Genomics that will do it for two or three thousand right? dollars 
The cost is falling dramatically. But earlier this year, in January, a company, Life Technologies, bought another company, Ion Torrent, and they produce this instrument called the Ion Torrent Proton. It actually uses a little solid state chip, which uh, has uh, hundreds of thousands of micro pH meters. And since DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, when DNA is synthesized, hydrogen ions are released. They're little micro changes in pH. It detects those and it can use those to reconstruct the DNA sequence. And in fact, their claim is that instrument will be available later this year, before October, so it's a little bit off, and sequence a genome in 24 hours for $1,000. Okay? Absolutely amazing. I showed this to my son. He watched Wally -E, the movie. He said it looks like Eva. Um, so it's science and science fiction present today. Uh, but what was even more astonishing is a few weeks after that announcement, a company called Oxford Nanopore announced a small sequencer that would fit in the palm of your hand, that would plug into a USB drive, that uses tiny nanopores, microscopic pores, that as a DNA molecule goes to an enzyme called DNAs and a base at a time is chewed off, the bases flow through these pores and small micro changes in current can be detected as the bases flow through blocking the pores. And the size of the, the uh, nucleic acid bases changes the current enough that you can detect it and reconstruct the sequence. And the, the vision that was presented when this instrument was presented is you could take a drop of blood, put it in here, plug it into your USB drive, and have a genome sequenced. Now, the, the uh, availability of this technology, the ability of this technology to do a whole genome hasn't yet been realized. But uh, the company is actually selling farms of these that you can plug in and sequence large quantities of DNA with a disposable DNA sequencer. And at that stage, almost anything goes, astonishingly. So the challenge is that all these new technologies are really transforming biomedical research from what was largely a laboratory science to what's increasingly an information science. What we really need are new approaches to make sense of all of this data. And the winners and losers in the race to understand disease are those best able to collect, manage, analyze and interpret the data. So to do that, what you have to do is make information integration really central to everything you do. And this was a problem I faced seven years ago when I arrived at Dana-Farber, that there's clinical data we collect on patients. Everyone is generating buckets of genomic data, but in fact bringing those things together has been next to impossible. So what we realized we could do is bring this data together into a central warehouse, we could reach out into the public domain and all the sources of information that are available there. And we could really use this data in creative ways to drive the development of new therapeutics, new diagnostics, the search for new drugs. And that by bringing the data and information together in creative ways, we could enable new discovery to be done. So this is just an example. And I won't go through the whole video because it's a few minutes long. But what this allows us to do is to actually look at our clinical data and look at our genomic data together and rapidly go into the data and to pull out information in this case like gender and ethnicity and response to therapy and genetic background and to define with a large database a cohort of patients, a group of patients. We can take that group and compare it to the characteristics of another group. That by being able to take these groups and distinguish them based on clinical, ethnic, genomic characteristics, environmental characteristics, smokers versus non-smokers, we can actually begin to understand what factors influence the development and progression of their disease. So I'm not going to let the video run in the interest of time, but what tools like this have allowed us to do is to begin to conduct research. So one of the projects I've been working on is a project very much like the one I described in breast cancer. We've been looking at ovarian cancer, and one of the challenges with ovarian cancer is that, in fact, the disease itself has always been thought of as a single disease in terms of the way it's treated. All ovarian tumors are treated exactly the same way. What we realized is that we could look at the data we have from a group of patients and simply ask, can we find distinct molecular subtypes? So Stefan Bentick and Benjamin Hobb Kahn's, who worked with me, took uh, data from 132 patients and looked at that data 
found subtypes and then validated the data in the using data from the public domain. And this is a red and blue picture of exactly that kind of data analysis I showed you earlier for leukemias. What we were able to do is to find two distinctly different subtypes. A group on the right where a set of genes are turned down at the top and turned up on the bottom and a group on the left where the pattern is different, where it's flipped. And the thing that's really interesting is when we asked what genes are driving the separation, it turns out that there are genes involved in the development of blood vessels, angiogenesis and vascular development. Now why is this important? Well as a tumor begins to grow it needs to feed itself. And the way it feeds itself is by sending out signals to develop blood vessels. So a third of the patients are actually developing blood vessels, they're sending out these signals to develop blood vessels. The question is, do they do better or worse than the other patients? And it's a little bit difficult to see here in this figure. There's a little yellow curve down here on the bottom. On the top are the blue curve, is a blue curve, that's two-thirds of the patients that don't express this kind of signature. And on the bottom is a little yellow curve where the patients um, uh, do express the signature the non-angiogenic above the angiogenic patients. And in fact, what we see is a difference in survival that's statistically significantly different. If we look at all of the data that's available in the public domain, what we see is these curves are much clearer. Now, 1,600 patients, not the 130 patients or 32 patients we analyzed. The curves are much clearer and much more significantly different. Okay? They're distinctly different. Now, why is this important? Well, there are currently clinical trials underway in which standard chemotherapy for ovarian cancer patients is being augmented by a drug called the Vastin or Bevacivimab that inhibits angiogenesis. The interesting numerology is that a third of the patients in those trials who are receiving the drug respond to the drug. Okay? We don't know if they're the same third that we would predict, but it suggests a follow-on study that we can do to actually see whether or not we can identify those patients up front and treat them appropriately. So we've been doing research using our ability to bring together clinical and research data. One of the things we have to do is present that data to our scientific colleagues. So this is an example of a data access portal that we created uh, for a lung genomics project we were involved in. And what we did when we looked at this is we realized that not all scientists are the same. You have quantitative scientists, you have laboratory scientists, and they approach data differently. The quantitative scientists, they have a use case, a way that we think about them using data, and their use case is very simple. The use case is, John, you're an idiot, just give me the data so I can analyze it the right way. But even they don't want all of the data, what they want to do is go shopping for data. So we essentially set up a little shopping cart where they can load up the cart with the data they want, it bundles it, and it delivers it to them. We realize that most of our biological colleagues work on particular genes or pathways, and pathways are collections of genes. So he gave them tools so they could go in and actually select genes, pull out those genes, and then get a report that tells them everything we know about those genes given the data that we've been able to collect. So in this case, we're looking at gene expression levels of a gene AKT1 that's important in respiratory diseases, and looking across patients with COPD, emphysema, ILD, interstitial lung disease, and matched controls. And we actually see them in the ILD patients the gene expression levels are suppressed slightly. Is this significant in terms of the biology? I don't know, but it gives us a clue that we can start to investigate and really try to understand the basis for disease. We've built tools to be able to look at this in the context of the genome and look at genes where they sit relative to other genes because their local environment is important. And we've used tools like the one I was showing you a video of to allow us to come in and select patient cohorts using genetic data together with demographic data and clinical data that we can feed into analysis tools to look for the genes that are truly different across the different assays we perform and to understand what those differences mean in terms of the biology. So we've built tools that really enable our colleagues who aren't necessarily quantitative scientists not to become what we like to call editors of genomic content where they don't have to be able to go in and, and program a computer to make sense of the data where they can touch the data, feel it, interpret it and learn something from it. One of the things I told you earlier is that we've tried to engage corporate partners and so we're really committed to finding the best of breed tools that are available and to do this in intelligent ways. Uh, the project I talked about in building this central warehouse, this database was initiated with a grant from the Oracle Corporation. We've partnered with a company IDBS to build that interface that I showed you to select cohorts. 
We've worked with Illumina, one of the sequencing technology companies, on a variety of different projects that have helped move our research forward. We're working with information content companies like Thomson Reuters to try to bring what's in the literature, both the scientific literature, the clinical trials literature, other places, other sources of information together to better understand disease and to figure out how to give it to patients. We've been building partnerships with other genomic companies to really take this information and package it in a way that we can start to develop new tools and new approaches to make sense of it. One of the things you have to do is enable research beyond your own. And uh, in my introduction, uh, Yvonne mentioned that I'm the director for the Center for Cancer Computational Biology. The mission of our center is actually to help other people analyze their data. And my associate director, Mick Carell, and I actually run this like a business. We run a consulting business. We bring people in, we meet with them, we help understand what their problem is, we develop an analytical solution, we estimate what it's going to take to solve their problem, and uh, we allow them to opt in or opt out of working with us. And if they work with us, we deliver answers to them very rapidly, very quickly, uh, in a way that they can interpret the data without having to be those quantitative scientists. One of the things you have to do is communicate your mission to the community. This talk is an example of me trying to do that in person, but I can't show up everywhere. So for our lung genomics project, what we did was we got, uh, we worked with a company, Axis International, to develop a website that would communicate to our friends and family, to people in society, about lung disease and why genomic uh, analysis of lung disease is important. Uh, when we worked with this company, we wanted to come up with an image that would convey lung disease or freedom from lung disease in breathing. So we have blue skies and green fields. It sort of looks like a Claritin box, probably because it's a, a, an image that works well. Uh, but what you can do is actually go and click on all of these different elements, all these different uh, menus, and get information about genomics, a primeron genomics, a primeron sequencing. Uh, a discussion of the people who are involved. And as you recognize, it really helps to have very attractive people on the website because it draws in friends and family. Uh, the last piece, and the reason this is so important, is that patient involvement is absolutely essential. Patients are our partners in curing disease. And educating people about why this is important has really become a fundamental part of the work that we do. That the problem is right now the incentive structure in medical research is skewed away from success in using genomics to understand disease. We all say we want to cure disease. What we really mean when we said is mostly we want to cure disease but only if I'm the one to cure disease. Because if you use my data, I don't get credit for making the discovery. So everybody hoards data and the thing we've seen is the only way to break that log jam is to get the patient advocates, the patients who contributed their tissue to research to come in and say, you don't own that, we own it. And we, as patients, want to cure disease, so we want the data to be available to people. And a big part of what I've been trying to do over the last few years is to get patients more involved in this process, more involved in understanding why this is important. So we've really come a long way in a short time, and genomics is, is really here to stay. And I just want to give you a little anecdote about why I believe this is true. In 2010, I had the opportunity to go to Australia for three months. Uh, to work with a group there on stem cell research, uh, looking at neuronal stem cells involved in neuropsychiatric diseases. My second day on the bus, I sat there, I looked up, and I saw this sign. It said, spitting is unacceptable, bus operators are now equipped with DNA kits to assist in the apprehension of offenders. And I knew I was in the right place to be doing genomic research, and that genomics was really part of our lives going forward. So I hope that's given you some understanding of why genomics is important, why bringing together all this data and information is really fundamental, and some of the approaches we're using to try to use these new technologies to really make sense of disease. My PhD was in physics. The revolution in physics, statistical mechanics, quantum mechanics, relativity, was driven by one and only one thing. And that's the availability of data. Okay, two things, really smart people. <laughs> but really smart people who had access to data. Uh, and what I hope we see today is that the data in genomics is going to drive exactly that same kind of revolution. So is the future here? Well, I like quotes. This is from William Gibson, a science fiction author. He said, the future is here. It's just not widely distributed yet. Uh, but with the $100 genome, it's going to be everywhere. So thank, uh, I just want to tell you, I wrote a little book about genomics. If you'd like to read it, you can get it on Amazon. It's about 10 bucks.
Um, people tell me it's a good read. And I just want to really point out that the work that I'm describing is not just work I've been doing, but really the work of an entire community, an ecosystem of people, and uh, uh, organizations that supported this work that have made it possible. So thank you very much for your invitation to present here. Um, and for those of you uh, who are here and who stayed, I'd be happy to answer questions.